Since the beginning of recorded history, the human race has been at war. First with members of their own family, then their fellow countrymen, and finally nations at large. Yet perhaps the starting ground for all these conflicts lays somewhere deeper within the very character of the human condition, in the dark, untouchable crevices of the human heart. It is said that the first iniquity of free will began even before the maiden pilgrimage from the embryo, preceding the very creation of the earth itself, in the forelife of souls in the heavenly realms. The dawn of warfare, some believe, was initiated by a fallen angel whose trespass against God was pride. In ancient Babylonia, in an age so long ago that the exact millennium remains in question, the Tower of Babel began construction. It was to be the single greatest achievement of the human race. A tower so tall that its summit would reach the heavens and by it prove to the world that their race was superior. It would be God's irony that it would never be finished. Time passed, nations fell, a machine age emerged, and once again the ingenuity of the species which held dominion over all others unveiled what was at the time the most monumental accomplishment ever imagined, the largest machine yet constructed. An automation so mammoth and so revered, even before its first demonstration, that its only befitting name was Titanic. On April 10th, 1912, it set sail. It was boasted to be the ship that God himself could not sink. It would be God's irony that the very element that was meant to keep it afloat would cause it to sink. Water, frozen water, in the form of an iceberg. Not even one voyage did it complete. And then the next age embarked in the annals of human history. Perhaps the last age. The space age. Competition for Victor was unparalleled. Powerful nations spent billions in unabashed rivalry to outdo the other. The Soviet Union launched the first orbiting satellite, the first animal, the first man. They had logged 500% more hours in space than the United States. And in June of 1969, they launched an unmanned probe to the moon to retrieve the first soil sample from another world just one month before Apollo 11. That's how close the race was. Had their unmanned probe not crash-landed into the lunar surface, the first moon rock brought back to Earth would have been by the Soviet Union. Richard Nixon, president at the time, had this to say about the latest work of the human hand. It is the greatest week since creation, the greatest event since the laying of the foundation of the seas, since the origin of the universe itself, since the design and formation of the delicate human eye through which all these things are perceived was a flying machine with its two passengers landing on its closest celestial neighbor and returning from where it came. Perhaps again, God's irony lies somewhere within this great boast of humankind. The building of the tallest tower for the sole purpose of standing out among the races was never finished. The machine that was so great that it was said to be untouchable by even God never completed its first voyage. And finally, the crowning achievement of humankind, the greatest boast of the species, the event in human history most associated with pride in our own accomplishments, landing on the moon. Twenty years later, and years behind schedule, the same space program couldn't put into Earth orbit a telescope with a lens that focused. And yet two decades earlier, a mission 100 times more complicated worked on its first occasion. With close scrutiny of the motives of the zealous Nixon administration, a critical examination of the entirely government-controlled press coverage, and newly discovered footage of the crew of Apollo 11 staging part of their mission, we wish to detail what may come to be the greatest government conspiracy of all time. A funny thing happened on the way to the moon.
trip in my rocket ship We'll have a lovely afternoon Kiss the world goodbye And away we'll fly Destination moon We'll travel fast as a light Till we're out of sight The earth will be like a toy balloon Oh, what a thrill you'll get riding on my jet A destination moon oh, We'll go up, 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 up Straight to the moon, we too High in the starry blue I'll be out of this world with you So away we'll steal in my space mobile A supersonic a honeymoon Leave your cares below, pull the switch, let's go. A destination moon. Dr. Von Braun, how would you say we stand in relation to the Russians, and do you think we can ever catch up? I'm convinced that in the space field, the Russians are ahead of us, particularly in uh, large weightlifting capability, and uh, that at the moment, the problem is not so much to catch up, but first build up the working speed that they have already demonstrated. After we are running as fast as they do, there's still a considerable gap to close, and only uh, the future will tell whether we'll manage to close that gap. We cannot and will not ever get into this race as we should, so long as all of our objectives are short-term objectives. We've got to have no finite end to our objectives. The end of our objectives should be as far as we can see at any given time. But right now, we need a 10 to 12 year program that has as its ultimate goal the man domination of space. And if we don't, we're going to be in trouble. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. We must assure our preeminence in the peaceful exploration of outer space, focusing on an expedition to the moon in this decade. T minus 60 seconds and counting. We pass T minus 60. 55 seconds and counting. Neil Armstrong reported back when he received the good wishes. Thank you very much. We know it will be a good flight. Good luck and Godspeed. 40 seconds away from the Apollo 11 liftoff. All the second stage tanks now pressurized. 35 seconds and counting. We are still go with Apollo 11. 30 seconds and counting. Astronauts report it feels good. T minus 25 seconds. 20 seconds and counting. T minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9. Ignition sequence start. Six.
unbeknownst to the citizenry, high above the earth, beginning at an altitude of 1,000 miles and extending an additional 25,000 miles, lay lethal bands of radiation called the Van Allen radiation belts. Every space mission in history with humans on board, from both the United States and Soviet Union, from the first in 1961 to the present, has been well below this deadly radiation field. Mercury, Gemini, Soyuz, Skylab, the Space Shuttle, all maintained altitudes well below 1,000 miles. All except Apollo. The more experienced Soviets spent 100 hours in space for every 20 hours of the US. In order to survive the hour and a half journey through this radiation field necessary to reach the moon and return, solid lead shielding between the astronauts and the exposure outside would be required. The mammoth Saturn V rocket used by Apollo was already 35 stories tall and weighed as much as a battleship. To add additional tonnage in the form of a lead barrier completely surrounding the crew members would have made it impossible for the vehicle to get off the ground. That is why the Soviets, though more advanced, only sent an unmanned probe to the moon. The Apollo spacecraft's narrowest shielding was less than one-eighth of an inch of light aluminum. In 1998, the Space Shuttle flew to an altitude of 350 miles, one of its highest altitudes ever, hundreds of miles below the beginning of a field of radiation that was so severe that the astronauts inside of their shielded spacecraft and inside of their shielded spacesuits saw flashes of light with their eyes shut that they described as shooting stars due to radiation penetrating first the shuttle's shielding, then their spacesuit shielding, then their skulls, and finally the retinas of their closed eyes. As a result, CNN issued the following report, noting NASA's unpredicted surprise. The radiation belt surrounding Earth may be more dangerous for spacewalking astronauts than previously believed. Scientists say the phenomena known as the Van Allen belts can spawn killer electrons when the Earth's magnetic field changes. These electrons that are being studied could have an important effect not only on satellites, which has happened in the past, but could also affect the astronauts by creating large doses of radiation that could influence their health. The electrons can penetrate through various materials, including spacesuits, and can pass through, in fact, the walls of the space station and can create high charges deep inside of these objects. President Kennedy, a man of political, not scientific background, set the irrevocable goal of landing a man on the moon by the end of the 1960s, just days after America's first astronaut had spent a mere 16 minutes in space, not even achieving a single orbit around the Earth. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. We take an additional risk by making it in full view of the world. But as shown by the feet of astronaut Shepard, this very risk enhances our stature when we are successful. The technology necessary to launch the massive Saturn V rocket and an intercontinental ballistic missile is 95% similar. When the Soviet Union launched mankind's first satellite, Sputnik, in 1957, there was grave concern that they had mastered space ahead of the United States and might use this advantage to launch a first nuclear strike from an orbit high above North America. When they also put the first animal in space, then the first man in space, then achieved the first spacewalk, the first crew of three, and the first ever of two simultaneously orbiting spacecrafts, Concern turned to fear and then horror as America watched their communist enemy achieve all these firsts with no hope in sight of ever catching up. Yeah, President, President uh, a member of Congress said today that he was tired of being seeing the United States second to Russia in the space field. I suppose he speaks for a lot of others. What is the prospect that we will catch up with Russia and perhaps surpass them? Russia in this field. However tired anybody may be, and uh, no one is more tired than, uh, uh, than I am, uh, it is a fact that it, uh, uh, it's going to take some time, and I think we have to recognize it. They secured these large boosters 
which have led to their being first in Sputnik and led to their first uh, putting their man in space. We are, I hope, uh, going to be able to uh, carry out our efforts with due regard to the problem of uh, the life of the man involved uh, this year. But uh, we are behind. If it was impossible to better the Soviets in the space race, which was really a race of technological armaments, what could be done? How could America offset the threat of superior weaponry? Throughout the history of rivalry and war, astute generals of lesser armies than their counterparts have used deceit and misinformation as a method to achieve victory. In World War II, for example, columns of inflatable tanks were placed at locations afar from Normandy to draw German forces away from the real location of invasion. The Star Wars missile defense program rigged tests to make it seem more advanced than it really was. That's the conclusion of the General Accounting Office. The aim was to fool the Soviet Union about U.S. military readiness during the Cold War. Certainly, it was not possible to fool just the Soviets about U.S. strategic capability in the 1960s while somehow informing 200 million Americans of the truth secretly. In order for them to believe the United States had the capability to go to the moon, everyone would have to believe it. Furthermore, the pride of a nation was at stake and the goal of a martyr, not to mention the growing unrest domestically of a government throwing tens of thousands of lives away in a foreign war riddled with contradiction and ambiguity. In addition, the Apollo program had already spent billions of dollars. If it failed to achieve its goal with such an investment, it would indeed be a large and bitter pill for the taxpayers to swallow. The cost of the program, whose sole goal was to be the first to plant a flag on the lifeless rock just outside the Earth, if adjusted for inflation to the 21st century, was $135 billion. With a profit margin of just 7%, this would be equal to over $9 billion profit going to the privileged contractors chosen by their friends at NASA. If the machinery was in fact only achieving Earth orbit, as other earlier missions had already done, then the completion and functionality of the other components would not have been as important, and even more profit would have been made. $135 billion could feed 2 million people for their entire lives. It could also buy 2 million two-bedroom houses. Yet how could such an undertaking be kept secret, and for such a long time? To the latter, one needs only to remember that an unsolved riddle six years older, the assassination of President Kennedy, still daunts the minds of the vast majority of Americans. As apparent of a conspiracy, as his assassin being assassinated himself, the truth of the matter has still escaped history. In keeping a secret of the magnitude of the Apollo missions being fraudulently created, one turns to the Manhattan Project for comparison. Surreptitiously building the first nuclear bomb during the early to mid-1940s involved 129,500 people over a three-year period. Yet the secret did not get out. A quarter century later, the art and technology of espionage inevitably improved, narrowing dramatically the number of players in the know of a large clandestine operation. Just one year before the first mission to the moon, NASA launched the Tetra satellite, specifically designed to simulate flight data coming from the moon, so that the ground crews could rehearse the landing, much as the astronauts did in their own simulations. Had it not supposedly fallen back to Earth, all that would have been needed during the actual flight would be a repeat of one of these computer programs, with a few original variations, transmitted to the satellite for rebroadcast to Houston Scores of computers and their deceived operators on the ground would then receive prearranged information, including the alleged location, altitude, and fuel consumption of the spacecraft, as if it were descending to the moon's surface. If the Soviets tried to find the actual location of an Apollo crew in the hundreds of thousands of miles surrounding the Earth and the moon, it would be tantamount to trying to find a rowboat in the Atlantic Ocean. The fact that the Apollo program was so departmentalized with various construction and test sites around the country meant that only a few people saw the whole picture. And for the first time ever, there was no independent press coverage of such an historical event. 
Whatever pictures and sound were distributed to the public were strictly controlled and previewed by the federal government. They were then disseminated unchecked until this hour. For who would realize that the unthinkable was not only possible, but absolutely true? And what of the photographs? What do they tell us? On three separate occasions, our office asked NASA's Public Relations Department for every single picture of an astronaut on the surface of the moon, just during the maiden voyage of Apollo 11. Many duplicates were sent. In all, fewer than 20 pictures were found, including first-hand investigation on site at the agency's vaulted archives. Quite surprising, considering the historical significance of the event. These very photographs are the same ones circulated year after year on anniversary commemorations. It is estimated that in just the first 60 minutes on the moon, motivated by the tenuous nature of the circumstances, many more exposures could have been expediently taken. Also surprising is the scarcity of photographs of the mission's chief pioneer, Neil Armstrong. The greatest achievement in human history and of the man whose first step echoed around the world dawning a new age of scientific enlightenment, there is only one full body picture of him on the moon besides this ghostly reflection. This one, taken by an automatic camera mounted on the side of the lunar module. Perhaps he feared liability should the whole conundrum later become unraveled. Perhaps he has forgotten that he attested to the authenticity of the event with his signature on this plaque engraved by the federal government. In fact, in the more than 30 years since the event, aside from NASA's initial press conference and the occasional brief anniversary remarks where few questions were permitted, he has never given one on-camera interview to anyone, ever. From an analytical standpoint, photographic anomalies have to be sought out with an understanding of lighting and shadows. The most straightforward is simple. When objects are lit solely by the sun, as all the scenes on the moon were said to be, after all, lighting equipment was not only impractical, it was unnecessary in bright sunlight, then all shadows, regardless of the landscape, will run parallel with one another and never intersect, as shown by this example. In these seldom seen photographs, obtained from a rarely used auxiliary NASA archival site, it is clear that these scenes were lit with artificial light. These shadows, which are cast at different angles, are evidence that a second light source is being used. In addition, the sun would not cause an isolated hotspot like this, only an artificial light would. Again, intersecting shadows and another hotspot and again, and again. It is simply impossible for this picture to have been taken with sunlight on the moon. Here, the shadows are shown to be as black as pitch. And yet here, completely in a shadow, the astronaut is lit up like a Christmas tree. How can this be? Or this, on the shadow side of the lunar module. In this magnification of an Apollo photograph, a rock, very likely a paper mache prop because of the crease here, is categorized with the letter C. In later releases of the same picture, the letter is gone, probably airbrushed out. Here, a crosshair, which was burned directly into the image from the film plate, and thus should always appear on top of the objects in the photograph, appears behind the object in this scene, clearly revealing a composite of two pictures into one. Someone apparently forgot to create a burn crater underneath the lunar module's 10,000-pound thrust engine, despite the fact that during ground tests there was a real concern for the vehicle falling into the hole the engine created as it descended. Here is a Norman Rockwell depiction drawn just two years earlier based on the latest specifications and scientific data. In these enlargements, it looks as though the lunar module was simply placed there, not even one speck of moon dust on the landing pod. As a result, all subsequent flights had to have the same discrepancy, which was explained away by the effect of no atmosphere. 
And what about stars? On the moon, with no atmosphere, they must have been quite a sight to behold. Yet there is seldom any mention of them, if ever, by any of the astronauts on any of the missions. Undoubtedly, creating a mural with all the constellations properly placed in the sky would have been virtually impossible to create accurately, much less realistically. A competent amateur astronomer would have been able to call attention to the slightest error in measurement. The answer? Not to talk about the stars. Ever. In their post-flight press conference, it was the only question to which Neil Armstrong responded with an absence of memory. When you looked up at the sky, could you actually see the stars and the solar corona in spite of the glare? We were never able to see stars from the lunar surface or on the daylight side of the moon by eye without looking through the optics. Uh, I don't recall during the period of time that we were photographing the solar corona what, uh, what stars we could see. I don't remember seeing any. Years later, though, Michael Collins would remember seeing the elusive stars and wrote about them in Expeditions to the Moon. It seems his memory improved the older he got. Why don't stars appear in any of the photographs? Simply because the proper, mostly closed exposure setting for the camera's iris set that way to compensate for the bright sunlight on the moon's surface completely diminished the faintness of relatively distant specks of diminutive light. This answer is true. It does not, however, explain why they never took any pictures of the stars by themselves, with an exposure setting perfect for them. While they took three automobiles to the moon, they never took a photographic telescope. Had they done so, they would have been able to see farther into the universe than had ever before been realized. If they had taken a telescope and were not actually on the moon, they would have had to concoct undiscovered galaxies that might one day prove to be non-existent. The cost of the three moon rovers in 21st century currency? Nearly 60 million dollars each. Though they had fewer parts than a jeep. Where was all this money going? Then there's the flag, blowing in the wind, at least twice, on the atmosphereless moon. We can only guess that most of the missions were staged inside for fear of possible aerial or satellite reconnaissance from an unfriendly nation. The backpacks, designed for one-sixth gravity, must have had the cooling systems removed to allow for movement without falling over. With very near and hot studio lighting, that left one hot astronaut inside. Assuming that it was the astronauts inside, after all, their faces were always covered. The necessary mammoth amounts of air conditioning were probably responsible for the air current. Here the editor cuts to a still shot of the flag, just as the effect becomes noticeable. Here it is unchecked. This rare clip, attained decades ago, was never re-released with the inevitable increase in experience and scrutiny. To demonstrate one-sixth gravity, a bouncy, floaty feel to the astronauts' movements would be similarly achieved with relative simplicity. Slow motion. You are viewing the scenes as they aired more than 30 years ago. Now let's look at them with the speed doubled. It becomes discernible that they are, in fact, in Earth's gravity and are no more leaving the ground than they would on Earth. It is clear from these rarely seen color television pictures that the crew of Apollo 11 brought a high resolution color video camera with them on their mission. Yet the only pictures broadcast live from the moon's surface were these from a low definition black and white camera. In fact, the networks complained because in addition to this, they were forced to shoot the images second generation off of a projection TV of the technology of 30 years ago and were not even allowed to take a direct feed, which further degraded the quality and clarity of the images. Perhaps this was precisely what NASA and the federal government had in mind. After all, it was a first, regardless of where they were. Better to open up their debut mission with fuzzy pictures and numerous blackouts rather than show too much revealing detail of a false scene that was yet unproven. And finally, the element that seals their fate. 
of all the footage of Apollo 11 requested from NASA over a five-year period, one gem was discovered just before the completion of this documentary. An old reel received by mistake. It contains the raw or unedited footage of the crew of Apollo 11, Michael Collins, Edwin Aldrin Jr. and Neil Armstrong, staging part of their mission for nearly an hour in living color with exceptionally clear behind the scenes audio of conversations discussing the techniques used to achieve a disingenuous picture depicting the earth at a distance in order to falsely demonstrate their far journey from it and their ability to survive passing through the Van Allen radiation belts. It cannot be misconstrued that this staging was done for some other reason prior to the mission, for the reel itself is slated and dated July 18th, 19th and 20th, 1969, the very days of the mission when they were said to be approaching and achieving lunar orbit. Furthermore, it is apparent they are in genuine zero gravity aboard the actual spacecraft, necessary to convince the mass media of their authenticity, just not any further than Earth orbit, as you will see. In this never-before-seen or heard footage, not only is the radio conversation between the astronauts and Houston Control audible, there is a secondary, private conversation taking place between the crew and a third confidential party, prompting the astronauts with what to say, when to speak, and how to effectively manipulate the camera to achieve the desired misleading effect. NASA claims that the Houston transmissions were the only ones taking place with the astronauts. Listen now as Houston Control initiates a conversation with the crew, only to find them too preoccupied with the behind-the-scenes trickery to respond. Moments pass and the oversight is picked up on by the clandestine third party who quickly prompts them with talk. Immediately, Neil Armstrong speaks. Hello, Apollo 11. Houston, Goldstone says that the TV looks so great. Over. Again, the illusion they are attempting to create is the Earth at a distance to demonstrate their far journey from it and their ability to survive passing through the Van Allen radiation belts. Understand, too, that only about 20 seconds of this raw footage was ever broadcast to the public, and these conversations discussing their deception were believed to be private until now. Here they discuss that these television transmissions were in fact not broadcast live as everyone believed. They were first screened and edited for playback later. Uh, Roger, Neil, we just wanted a narrative such that we can, when we get to playback, we can sort of correlate what we're saying. Thank you very much. Here they discuss the fact that they have turned out the lights and have blocked out sunlight from entering the spacecraft through the other windows as to not cause any reflected light to fall onto the spacecraft's wall in the foreground. Okay, very good. Well, we shut out the sun coming in some of the other windows into the spacecraft, so uh, it's looking through a, uh, the uh, number one window and there isn't any uh, reflected light. The reason this was done is so that the truth of the matter would not be revealed. It is this. Though the federal government would have you believe that this is a view of Earth from a distance out of the spacecraft's window as it nears the moon, it is not. What they have ingeniously done is placed the camera at the back of the spacecraft and centered the lens on a circular window in the foreground, outside of which it is completely filled with the Earth in low orbit. The circumference of the window then appears to be the diameter of the Earth at a distance, with the darkened walls of the spacecraft appearing to be the blackness of space around it. That is why they wanted the interior dark and blocked out the sun from entering through the other windows. Here you can see the extruded window, probably two inches thick at the bottom. This is because the Earth shine is coming in at a downward angle. It also causes the Earth to appear to be an irregularly shaped circle, for you are seeing the outside of the window at the bottom and the inside of the window at the top, which together form two different sized halves of a circle. Subsequently, this take was never used. 
As they perfected the shot, a crescent-shaped piece of black material was inset slightly into the window to create the illusion of the Earth's terminator line dividing night and day. It is uncannily convincing. During this segment, intended to be edited and played back later for the worldwide television audience, dated July 18, 1969, Neil Armstrong condemns himself as he states that he is 130,000 miles out, or halfway to the moon, as the NASA flight log also states on this date, when he is in reality in low Earth orbit of a few hundred miles. Roger, Houston, Apollo 11. Calling in from about 130,000 miles out. Here, during another segment, also intended to air after review, Neil Armstrong falsely explains to the viewers how the shot is attained by putting the camera's lens to the window's glass, as it would have to be if they were the claimed distance away from the Earth. We only have one uh, window that uh, has a view of the Earth, and it's filled up with the TV camera. If the window was completely filled up with a TV camera, as he stated, then an astronaut's arm would not be able to get between the camera and the window, as it obviously does here in this outtake. South America becomes invisible just off beyond the Terminator or inside the shadow. You can also notice how the astronaut operating the camera reacted to the mistake by attempting to pan away from it. The white bands of major cloud formation across the Earth. This is a segment that they believed wasn't even being recorded, much less suitable for broadcast, for the lens was being zoomed out and the scene was being changed to that of an interior of the astronauts at work and apparently the stop button popped back up on the recorder without notice. Here is the diffused work light that they used to see camera controls but not throw light onto the spacecraft's wall. Here they remove part of the crescent insert Finally, the iris is opened up and you can see the real location of the camera and the very bright and near Earth out the window. Here is the slate for the 19th of July and the same shot of trickery on the 19th of July. And then the 20th and the same misleading shot on the 20th. Later that evening, they were said to be walking on the moon how can this be when they were in Earth orbit only nine hours earlier and the moon is some three days journey away? Furthermore, if they genuinely went to the moon, why would they be faking any part of it? Why this trickery with the window? By faking being halfway to the moon, it becomes apparent that they did so because they could not even go halfway. It thus confirms that the stumbling block to their success was the lethal radiation of the Van Allen radiation belts. Since the same equipment was used on the subsequent missions in the 40 months that followed, none of them could have gone to the moon. They only increased their proficiency at staging them. When some TV viewers of the second manned mission to the moon telephoned the networks complaining that reruns of I Love Lucy were being interrupted, it became clear that for the taxpayers, once was enough. But it wasn't enough for the government and contractors. Billions of dollars of pure profit went with each return. How coincidental that the following mission would have the element of life and death jeopardy. Apollo 13. Now the public would take going to the moon more seriously and be reconnected with the drama. We now realize that perhaps the reason Neil Armstrong has never given an on-camera interview is because he doesn't want to lie anymore. What threats may have been made upon such honorable men or their families to possess their reluctant cooperation and later ill feelings towards perpetuating this still darkened hour in American history? NASA's highest ranking official, James Webb, resigned without explanation just days before the first Apollo mission. Why, when he was on the threshold of achieving the greatest accomplishment of his career? 
All three Apollo 11 astronauts also resigned shortly after their return. On the 25th anniversary of the event, in 1994, Neil Armstrong made a rare public appearance and held back tears as he spoke these brief cryptic remarks before the next generation of taxpayers as they toured the White House. Today we have with us uh, a group of students among America's best. To you, we say, we have only completed a beginning. We leave you much that is undone. There are great ideas undiscovered, breakthroughs available to those who can remove one of truth's protective layers. He is that layer. Perhaps someday soon, with the uncovering of this footage and its meaning, the true patriots of America will rise up or come forward and free the citizens and themselves from the sin that so easily entangles and from a federal government that needs to have the gangrene cut off. Even if the government's destruction would come from the truth, then it is not worthy to stand and its betterment would inevitably follow. All of us are mortal. All of us will die. Perhaps the seeking of a clear conscience before that hour will motivate the truth into the light. Perhaps as citizens we should offer amnesty for this and other crimes of history for facts from those involved before the truth perishes with them. Why must we wait until the year 2017 to open the Kennedy assassination files? Perhaps they will not even be opened then, for the law that reluctantly stipulates their release says so with this clause. Quote, with the exception of documents certified for continued postponement by the president. Whoever believes the citizens to be too immature for the truth are too immature for power. The truth will always set us free.